Good evening and welcome to our month 11. This is July edition of the 10 Digging Deep podcast. I'm very excited to get to study this with you. I've been kind of studying it all day long and we're going to dig tonight. We're going to get into some um, deep discussion, I think, Um, and I hope that you will text us your comments and your questions, but our purpose tonight is to show that beyond a shadow of a doubt, even these 10, all of the Old Testament Mosaic law has been fulfilled, completed, abrogated at our 2021 time of being Christians and walking in law. We are also going to show that our new covenant does have a law and that we are bound to follow that law. So I hope that you are ready for some uh, intellectual gymnastics or um, aerobics, I'm going to say, some good exercise spiritually tonight. I'm very excited tonight to have Julie Cantor with us. Julie, welcome. Thank you for having me. So glad that you're here. She has graciously agreed on top of our, we've had a busy week this week. We have done Family Bible Week this week, and we've been here every night, even last week until late, working on our um, little skits and sets that we were doing for Family Bible Week. We try to really portray those. It was parables this year. We try to really portray those on a level that the children will enjoy and not forget. And I watched yours. You were a plant. Yes. And you were in the good soil. Yes. And the sun came out and you sang with the sun, Mm -hmm. but you uh, were not harmed by the sun like was the plant that was on the rocky soil. You were harmed by the sun because why? Because my roots were nice and deep. Because she had roots that were nice and deep. And so that was, I, I loved their skit because it was just so very biblical. It's just like looking at a living picture of the parable that Jesus taught. I was a pig in the good in the prodigal son, and I was a pig that did not let the prodigal son eat my food. I was selfish with my food, just like the Bible says. And so we enjoyed that very much, but we worked for an entire week getting that ready, and then we've been here all week doing it. Last night we were here until late tearing it down. And so it's been quite a week in lots of ways. But Julie was gracious enough to say, I'll come read scripture for you. I'll do this for you. And so I'm very grateful. She is um, a great, not only a great Bible student, but I'm just going to say probably one of, if not the, most talented people I know. She is amazing. Um, I thought that last year we were doing... um, our keepers program for lads to leaders and a couple of years ago actually and so I was going to teach her to sew oh my (laughs) she can sew things that I've never even started to think about sewing and paint and she can um, she's pretty amazing but for her to take the time tonight is just something that I'll always be grateful for thank you thank you for coming tonight We are going to begin. uh, First, before our prayer, I do want to say that uh, Spark, our Polishing the Pulpit Spark at West Huntsville, is the place from which our Digging Deep topic for next year will be revealed. It's the place where we will recognize in our little way the people who have completed Digging Deep for 2020, 2021, the last year. We're on month 11 of that year, and so there's one more month to complete. So we will recognize those people, the ones who are able to attend anyway. We will recognize those people. We'll have our reveal of next year's study at our Spark, but it will come to you live via live stream from this location. If you can come, there's still plenty of time to go and register. It's westhuntsville.org. Uh, where you can get information. It's also at the Polishing the Pulpit slash Spark site. You can get information and register from either of those places. Uh, We will be the podcast for the month of August. We'll be coming your way on Monday, the 23rd of August at 9 o'clock a.m. 
Monday, August 23rd at 9 a.m. The reveal for next year's study, where we will announce the topic and kind of introduce the study, will be coming your way on Monday at 2 p.m. And then on Tuesday at 9 o'clock, we'll have a further introduction, introduction, introduction to next year's study. So those events will be coming to you live stream. The rest of Polishing the Pulpit will be just for the people who are here and then later for the people who uh, would like to watch the archives. And those archives, I believe, many of them will be showing from the Gospel Broadcast Network and all of them will be available, I believe, later on from Polishing the Pulpit. So it's a great, exciting month and a whole lot to do. So if you'll pray for us, that would be that would be just a great favor for us. And now we're going to bow in prayer and then we're going to dig right in where we'll, we will be beginning with Galatians chapter 3. Let's bow. Father, we are just so very thankful for this opportunity to come together from various places in the United States and even um, later via the archive from places that are abroad. We are so thankful for not only our English-speaking sisters who study along with us, but our Spanish-speaking sisters. We're thankful for the new women who are joining Digging Deep on a weekly basis. I'm seeing those names come in, and I'm grateful for them. I pray that you will bless every single heart tonight. Bless the hearts that are delivering. Father, the comments uh, via our uh, live stream, via Facebook, and from this table where we're sitting, help us, Father, to have wisdom and help us to apply your word as you would have it applied. Help us to always be humble before your word. This is not about us, and we don't think that we know all that, that there is to know about your word. But we pray, Father, that you will help us to realize that there is absolute truth, that there is a faith for which we are to contend, and help us as women to always submit to your word. Help it to do the ultimate good tonight and no harm. And it's in the name of Jesus who made all this possible that we pray. Amen. All right, we are going to um, not exactly follow the text from our study book tonight, but I think by the time we're finished, you will be able to fill in all those blanks. So listen carefully. I'm going to give you some notes along the way, but we're going to begin with a question. What is the purpose? What is the purpose of the old law? What's the purpose of that? And we're going to read, uh, Julie's going to read Galatians 3 verse 19, and we'll discuss that for just a little bit. Galatians 3 verse 19. <clears throat> Why then the law? It was added because of transgressions until the offspring should come to whom the promise had been made, and was and, and it was put in place through angels by an do you not know that word? Mediator. Do you have a mediator? Uh, intermediary, which means a mediator. By an intermediator. Okay. So um and that's that's good because that's a word that I didn't even have in my version. So um Mine says a mediator. So when we talk about verse 19, we're going to say here that the purpose of the old law, first of all, it tells us why the old law was added. It was added because of transgressions. Now, transgression is sin. Sin, by definition, is a transgression against God. So the law was put into place so that those transgressions against God could be recognized in the lives of men. That old law was never to remedy our transgressions. We learn that from Galatians 4, verses 4 and 5. If you'll flip over to chapter 4 and read 4 and 5, we'll learn that really we couldn't receive our adoption as sons of God under the old law. Go ahead and read 4 and 5. Galatians 4. Mm-hmm. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive, receive adoption as sons. So what that verse just said that you read is that God had to send his son in order for us to get that adoption. In order for us to get that redemption, the son had to come. He, our sins could not be remedied until the time that the son had come. Now turn to Hebrews 10, Hebrews 10 and verse 4. 
Hebrews 10 and verse 4. And when you get there, if you'll just read that for us, Julie. For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Okay, so it, the blood of bulls and goats is all that there was in the Old Testament days. And so it was impossible for those to take away sins. So here we have Galatians 3.19. The old law was added so that we could recognize our sins, but the old law could not remedy our sins. So recognition, but not remedy for our sins. But it did show us, Romans chapter 7, it did show us how bad sin was. We could look at the law and say sin, we could recognize what um, an infraction, what an awful thing sin was. So let's read verse 7 first of Romans chapter 7. Okay. What shall we, what then shall we say? That is the, that the law is sin? By no means. Yet if it had, if it had not been made for the law, I would have not, I would have not known sin. Okay, so except for the law had said thou shalt not covet, I wouldn't have even known what coveting was. Is the law sin? We wouldn't have known how bad sin was. We wouldn't have known the negative consequences of sin were it not for the law that was given. So it can't remedy sin, but it can show us sin. Go ahead and read verse 13 of that same chapter. Did that which is good then bring death to me? By no means. It was sin producing death in me through what is good in order that sin might be shown to be sin and through the commandment might become sinful beyond measure. Sinful beyond measure is what was shown us by the commandment. We couldn't have known that. Old Testament people couldn't have known that except that the commandment was given. So, first of all, it was added because of transgression. You saw that. It couldn't remedy sin. It did show us what and how bad sin is. So, and also when we read that it was added so that we could know what sin was and so that we could know that sin was sinful beyond measure, as she just read, we know that, that the law of Moses didn't come at creation. It was added later so that we could have this listing of sins and transgressions so that Old Testament folks could know how sin, what sin was, recognizing that covetousness was sin. So we also know that the purpose of the law was never to be forever. It was always intended, Galatians 3, it was always intended just until the seed came. And when she read seed a while ago, she didn't use the word seed. Let's hear her word again in Galatians 3, verse 16 from her version. Galatians 3, 16. Right. Now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say, and to offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one. And to your offspring, who is Christ. Whoa, and it identifies the seed there. So the law came, and she read this in verse 19 as well, just until the offspring came. The law came, and my version, King James Version here says, just until the seed came. And then it identifies the seed. The law was just, the law of Moses was just until Christ, the offspring of God, came. And, she, and we saw that from both of those ver versions. Now, also, we see that the law of Moses, and we're going to spend a lot of time on this tonight, the law of Moses was inferior. It was never as good as the Christian system. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 3. We're bouncing back and forth from Galatians to Hebrews, and we're going to spend a lot of time in Hebrews tonight. So if we look at Hebrews chapter 3, and let's, um, let's read, Julie, verses 5 and 6. And from that, we're going to see that the old law never was to be as perfect, as complete, as whole, as redemptive as the new law. Always it was inferior to the Christian system. Hebrews 3, verses 5 and 6. Now Moses was faithful in all God's house as a servant to testify to the things that, that were to be spoken later. But Christ is faithful over God's house as a son, and we are, we are his house, if indeed we hold fast our confidence and our boasting in our hope. Well, this is how Moses was a servant. 
but Christ was a son. And so the law of Christ gives us our confidence. And there are so many. That's what the book of Hebrews is about. If you, you know, the one word that probably encapsulizes Hebrews is better. The new law is better than the old law. And we're going to see lots of ways that that is true as we study through the book of Hebrews. But we'll just begin with verses 5 and 6 of chapter 3. So in this question, I want us to understand that the reason for the law it was added because of transgressions to make us recognize them. It could not redeem us. It could not remedy sin, but it could it could point it out. It could identify sin. And it was added. It did not it didn't begin at creation. It was never intended to last forever either. It was only to last until the offspring of God came, and it was always inferior to the Christian system that was God's eternal plan for the salvation of our souls. Now, the next question is, are we still under the law? Now, I think we've pretty much answered that already as we discussed this first question, but I wanted us to look at some passages about this, and the first one is an Old Testament passage back in Isaiah, back in Isaiah chapter 2. If you'll turn to Hebrews, I'll get the Hebrews 7, I'll get the Isaiah one. Listen to Isaiah chapter 2, verses 2 and 3, and this is obviously about the coming of the kingdom. It will come to pass, Isaiah said, in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house will be established in the top of the mountains and will be exalted above the hills, and all nations will flow unto it. And we're talking about the kingdom of Christ there because this is the first time that all nations could come into the kingdom. And many people will go and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion will go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. So we're not under the old covenant, but are we still under a law? Well, it says here that the law will go forth from Jerusalem. When did the law go forth from Jerusalem? In Acts chapter 2 and following, the law, the new law, the new covenant went forth from Jerusalem. And so even though we are not under the law of Moses because it was never intended to last forever, it was only until the offspring came, this passage tells us that we're very much still under a law in the new covenant. And this is really important for our day and age when all authority seems to be um, subject to balking from our society. There is no truth. We can't know truth. There is no ultimate authority. But we are, as Christians, called to be under a law even today. So let's read about that law again in Hebrews 7, verse 12. You read that for us. Hebrews 7, verse 12. For when there is change in the priesthood, there is necessarily a change in the law as well. Okay, so we're going to talk about that change in the priesthood in a minute. But it doesn't say that, that there was no law. It says when the priesthood changed, the law had to change. Let's read uh, Romans. Let's go to Romans, and we'll go to Romans 7 and Romans 8. But we'll start in Romans 7 and read verse 25, and we're going to find the word law there. Romans 7 and verse 25. Thanks be to God through Christ, Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. Wow, here's Paul in Romans talking about the law of God that he serves in the Christian dispensation. All right, go to Romans 8, verse 2, and read that one for us. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the from the law of sin and death. Wait, the law of the Spirit in Christ has set us free. There is a law under which we live today. Let's turn, you turn to 1 Corinthians 9, and I'll get Galatians 6, verse 2. Galatians 6, verse 2. She's faster than I am. Okay, Galatians 6, verse 2 says, Bear one another's burdens. I should have been able to quote this. And so fulfill the law of Christ. There is a law 
And we're pointing this out in multiple passages. Okay, so 1 Corinthians 9, if you'll read 20 and 21. To the Jews, I became as a Jew in, in order to win, to win Jews. To those under the law, I became as one under the law, not though not being myself under the law, that I might win those under, under the law. To those outside the law, I became as one outside the law, not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ that I might win those outside the law. Okay, the key phrase there that I wanted to look at, how many times was law there? Let's see. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight times we have law there. Most of the time in the context, it's about the law of Moses. But in the verse 21 that she read, being not without law to God, but under the law to Christ, that I might gain those who are without law. He's talking about the Gentiles. I'm going to go and I'm going to gain those who never were under the law of Moses and invite them, try to get them to be under the law of Christ. Verse 21 that she just read. And he says, I, I, I became a Jew. I, I did everything that I could do as a faithful Jew so that I could influence Jews to come under the law of Christ. And then I went to those people who were Gentiles and I... I Judaism was not important to me when I was in their midst. What was important to me was to influence them to be under the law of Christ. We are still under law. That is very important for us in this context to understand. Now, she just read in Hebrews 7 verse 12 that when the priesthood changed, the Old Testament priesthood, when that changed, the law had to change as well. Um, uh, that's sort of like, Julie, if we did away with the presidency of the United States today, would we have to change a bunch of laws? Yes. Obviously we would. We'd have to change our voting laws. We'd have to change our, our whole form of government with the three branches of our government. We would have to change. There's a bunch of laws about qualifications for the presidency that we would have to change. There's a lot that would have to be changed if we changed the leadership of the United States of America. This is saying that when the priesthood changed, the legal system had to change. So it's saying we're, we're still under a law, but it is not that law. It's a different law that changed when the priesthood changed. So I want us to notice how exactly the priesthood changed. And first I want us to notice that in the Old Covenant, the priests were temporary. Why was a priest temporary under the old law? It's because he died. He died. And so his son had to become the next Aaronic or Levitical priest. So the priesthood constantly changed. But the priesthood since Calvary has not changed. Christ is our permanent priest. So we read Hebrews 7, 12 already. Let's get back in Hebrews 7. And if you'll read verse 23, Hebrews 7, verse 23, we're going to read about the permanency of Christ's priesthood as opposed to the Aaronic priesthood. Hebrews 7, verse 12. The former priests were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in office. Okay, so they were prevented by death from continuing in office. But 624 is, tells us about the priesthood of Christ. 624. Hebrews 6, verse 24. I did not see a 24. Oh, I have that wrong. I probably have that wrong. Let's look at, um, no wonder you weren't reading. <laughs> Let me see what I'm looking for. Because um, I want us to get it right. Let's see if, um, if I'm in 7. Let's see. Yeah, 724. So it's not 624. It's 724. So let's read that. 723 and 724. So you read 23. Go ahead and read 24. But he holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. Okay. He has an unchangeable priesthood. He holds it permanently. So our priest is permanent. That's the first thing that we get. And then when we read 26 and 27 of that same chapter, we get that their priests were unclean. Their priests had to go in every day and offer sacrifices first for their own sins before they could offer sacrifices for the sins of the people. And our priest doesn't have to do that because he has no sin. Verses 26 and 27 of Hebrews 7. For it was 
For it was indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. He has no need like those high priests to offer sacrifices daily, first for his own sins and then for those of the people, since he did it once for all when he offered up himself. So first of all, our high priest is permanent. Secondly, our high priest is clean. And thirdly, our high priest just had to offer a one-time sacrifice. She just read that in verse 27 of Hebrews chapter 7. But we also read it in Hebrews chapter 9, verses 25 to 28. You'll get 9, I'll get 10. Hebrews 9, 25 to 28. I might stop you in here. Okay. Nor was it to offer himself repeatedly as the high priest enters the holy places every year with the blood, not it, not his own, for then he would have had to suffer repeatedly, rep repeatedly, yes, since the foundation of the world. But as it is, he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead and read 27 okay. and 28. And just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment. So Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who, eagerly, who are eagerly waiting for him. I love this because it says that, you know, verse 24, Christ entered the holy place, the, not the one made with hands, but heaven itself. And he doesn't have to offer sacrifices every day, verse 25, or every year. If that was the case, he would still be suffering on the cross year after year after year. But Christ, verse 28, was once offered to bear the sins of many. And I love that the way she read it from, are you reading the ESV? I am. I love the way she read it because he, he, he's going to come the second time not to deal with sin. He's already dealt with sin. He dealt with sin that one time. And he doesn't have to deal with it anymore. I love that. But he's coming back to get me, not to deal with my sin, because he already dealt with my sin that one time. He doesn't have to keep doing it like the Old Testament priest did. And then I'll get Hebrews 10, verse 11 and 12. Every priest stands daily ministering and offering, oftentimes the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. How frustrating. But this man... After he had one time offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. So we have that our priest is our priest is permanent, our priest is clean, and our priest gave a one time sacrifice. And that availed because he was permanent and because he was clean. And then lastly, he went permanently beyond the veil. In the Old Testament, the high priest could only go beyond the veil one time every year on the Day of Atonement. But here we read that Jesus went and sat down beyond the veil. He stayed beyond the veil. So let's look at chapter 9, Hebrews 9. And really, I want us to look at 1 to 11 there. So um, let's, let's just, uh, we'll summarize the first few verses. There was a tabernacle. In the tabernacle, there was a candlestick. I love the way that the Hebrew writer here is reminding the people what they already knew. There was all this stuff in the, in the temple, and there was the holiest of all places. And inside that, there was the golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant that had gold all around it. And inside the Ark of the Covenant, there was that manna that they had picked up in the wilderness that never did rot. And there was Aaron's butt rod that grew flowers. And there were the tables of the covenant. The Ten Commandments were written on there. And the cherubims were in there. And then the priest had to go into the first tabernacle always. They did that every day. They had to go into the, into the first tabernacle. But read verse 7. But into the second, only the high priest goes, and he but once a year, and not without taking blood, which he offers for himself and for the unintentional sins of the people. So for these unintentional sins of the people, the high priest could go in the most holy place, the second beyond the veil, one time every year. And the Holy Spirit did this, signifying, telling us that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, or we didn't know it yet. While the first tabernacle was standing, 
and verse 9 tells us that that first tabernacle was a figure for the time then present. That was all they had, and that was where they offered their gifts and sacrifices. But what does it say that those gifts and sacrifices couldn't do in verse 9? Those gifts and sacrifices could not do what? Um, perfect the conscience of yeah. the worship, yeah. worshiper. It could never perfect their consciences. It could never make them clean. Verse 10, which stood only in meats and drinks and divers washings and carnal ordinances until the time of reforming a different law, making a new law, getting rid of the priesthood. Verse 11 is key. Read verse 11. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation. Go ahead, 12. He entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. Uh, he went into the beyond this veil and sat down on the right hand of God forever, permanently beyond in the holy of holies. That's how our priest is different from the priests of the Old Testament. And so our priest is changed. So our law had to change, and we get a new law. And Julie, is our new law better? Yes, it is. Our new law is better, and that's our next point. Is our new covenant better? Well, let's look at some verses again in Hebrews that show us that. In Hebrews chapter 10, which is where we almost are, and also... Um, I saw it here in verse 9 as well, but we'll look at chapter 10, and we'll go to verses 28 and 29, if you'll read those for me. Anyone who has set aside, has, who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on at the evidence of two or three witnesses. How much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has... Outrage the spirit of grace. Oh, wow. That passage is just very potent because what it's telling us is the person who just disregarded, blatantly disrespected Moses' law had to die. But how much worse it is. We have a different priest. We have a holy priest. We have a clean priest, a permanent priest. Who, who gave his life for us. How much worse is it if we disregard his covenant? I'm going to tell you that the new law is better just by the fact that it is more serious to reject it because it's perfect, it's complete, and it required the blood of the Son of God. So it's a much more serious thing to reject it than it was even to reject the law of Moses. Secondly, it was built on better promises. That's in chapter 8, verse 6. Chapter 8, verse 6. It was built on better promises. Read that one for us. But as it is, Christ has obtained a ministry that is a much more that is that is as much more excellent than than the old as the covenant he medi he mediates it better. So, since it has enacted on better promises. It was enacted on better promises. Promises. What was the promise of the Old Testament? Could it promise permanent forgiveness of sins? Mm -mm. Could it promise heaven? Mm -mm. Not without the blood of Christ. But now we have this priesthood who is ministering to us in this excellent ministry that has a promise of heaven itself for us because of the sacrifice that he made for us. I love it. It's a more excellent ministry. So, so this covenant is better because it was more serious to reject. It's better because it was built on better promises. It's better because the one who revealed it was perfect. The one who told us about the new covenant was perfect. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, the very beginning of the book. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Go ahead and read those. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. Okay, I want us to think about this just for a minute. Did the Old Testament prophets ever mess up? Yes. Oh, yeah. Can you think of an example of one that messed up? 
I was kind of putting you on the spot probably, but think about Jonah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he messed up. He disobeyed God. He was God's prophet, but he didn't go the right way. And now think about in 1 Kings chapter 13, we might have talked about this last week. There was that prophet who went to um, the altar of, maybe this was another lesson I was doing somewhere else, but he went to this altar of Dan at, at Dan and Bethel where Jeroboam was uh, idolatrous and f- causing the people to commit lascivious sins and all that. And, and God's prophet went there and God said, I don't want you to go home and eat with anybody in that land. And I want you to go home a different way. And But a false prophet came to him and said, oh, I'm a prophet too. And God said for you to come home with me. And it was a lie. But God's prophet believed the lie. And so he did something that God said he shouldn't do. And because he believed a man over God, he was torn by a lion. And I, if, if you just go to 1 Kings chapter 13, you can read all about, all about that. But what it shows us is that God's prophets were not perfect. Sometimes they messed up. Sometimes they became, Jeremiah became very discouraged. Um, and, you know, God had to go and say, but I still have this many people who haven't bowed the knee. Lots of times God's prophets showed their imperfections. But in the last days, this new covenant was, wasn't spoken to us by a man prophet. It was given to us by the perfect, complete whole, sinless revelator, Jesus Christ. So our law is better because it was revealed by the perfect revelator. And then lastly, it's better, and there's lots of reasons it's better, but I stopped with four, because it's not the shadow, it's the real thing. It's not the shadow of an image, it's the image. And I love that fact about, uh, you know, when we read about the priests, they were just shadows of Christ. When we read about the tabernacle and the temple, that's just a shadow of the church. When we read about the blood of bulls and goats, that's just a shadow of the blood of Christ. When we read about the washings of the old law, that's just a shadow of baptism. When we read even about their crossing of the Red Sea, the Bible tells us that that's just a shadow of our of the way that we come into Christ. And circumcision of the flesh was just a shadow of our circumcision of the heart. They had all the shadows. We don't have to deal with shadows because we have the real thing. And that's Hebrews 10 verse 1. Go ahead and read Hebrews 10 and verse 1. For since the law has has but a shadow of the good things to come, instead of the true form of these realities, it can never, by the same sacrifices that are continually offered year by year, make perfect to those who draw near. Yeah, the law is just a shadow. And we have, what was your word for image? Was it image in verse 10? Instead of the true form. The true form of the realities. You know, I like her word better than mine because sometimes when we think about image, we think of a picture of something. But what this is really saying is that they had shadows and we have the real thing. We have the form. We can touch it. We have the real thing today. So it's better because of those four reasons. And the next question is about Matthew 5, 17 through 20. Let's turn to Matthew 5 if you're watching. Go ahead and I'll give you a minute to get to Matthew 5 because we need to look at this one together. Matthew 5, 17 to 20. Okay, if you want to read those, Julie, we'll talk about those. Matthew 5, 17 to 20. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota nor a dot will pass through the law until, until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least... Of, These commandments and teaches others to do the same will be the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be will be great will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Okay, so we're talking about verse 17. Think not that I am come to, she said abolish. That's a synonym of what mine says. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy it, but I am come to fulfill it. 
So I ask you to get the definitions of the word for destroy or abolish there. And the definitions according to Strong's are to loosen down, to disintegrate, to demolish, to halt for the night, to destroy, to dissolve, to overthrow, to throw down, to disunite what has been joined together, to render something vain, to deprive something of success, or to bring something to naught. So there are lots of meanings there, synonyms, to the word destroy or abolish. And some of them are really different in their nuances in what they really mean as we read them. So when we read Christ say, think not that I'm come to destroy the law, but I'm not come to destroy it, but to fulfill it. I want us to look at Romans chapter 14, verse 20. And I'll turn there and read that one just for the sake of getting the same uh, word, the same wording that, we're, that we've been reading from the King James Version here. So Romans 14 and verse 20. And it says there, and, and this is in a context of, remember the eating of meats. And... And they're dividing over whether or not a meat was clean or unclean. And we know that all meats in our new covenant are clean before God. We can eat pork now. And they couldn't eat pork in the Old Testament. But, but verse 15, and this is a parallel passage to 1 Corinthians chapter 8. But if your brother be grieved with... Um, I want to make it. Yeah, 1 Corinthians chapter 8, I believe is right. But if your brother be grieved with your meat... Now walkest thou not charitably or no longer in love? Destroy not your brother with meat, because Christ died for your brother. If your brother is stumbling and is going to fall away from God because you're eating meat, just don't eat the meat. That's what he's saying. I want to be sure that I gave you the right passage. That's that's the parallel passage. I just am, yeah, 1 Corinthians chapter 8, and especially the last verse of that chapter. So as we're reading this this about meat verse 20 says don't destroy the work of god for meat don't destroy the work of god for meat wow that's the same destroy that we read in verse 17 of matthew chapter 5 don't destroy the work of god for meat i want to ask you a question can we literally can cindy collie literally destroy any work of God just by my attitude about something or my action about, I'm not going to destroy the work of God. He's God. I can't destroy his work, but I could make his work be in vain for me or maybe for another person that I'm influencing. I could make his work be in vain. I could bring it to naught in my case. That's what this is saying. Christ did not come to make the law of no effect, to make God's work in vain. Christ didn't come to make the law of Moses all in vain or the prophets all in vain. He didn't come to make them in vain. He came to be the fulfillment of them. He, came, he was the whole purpose of the law of Moses. And so he came to fulfill to give the end, to be the fulfillment of the promise of the law of Moses. The law of Moses was there because of Jesus Christ. And he said, I didn't come to make the law of no effect. I came to be the effect. I came to fulfill the law. And I love that um, when we read that with that meaning, it makes so much, we can't demolish the purpose of God. But we can make it of none effect in our own lives. Jesus ended the power of the law. He stopped its binding nature. But he didn't destroy its work. He fulfilled its work. He was the fulfillment of it. So I want to ask you this, and I hope that I'll get some comments here. Go ahead and tell me how you think are some ways today that we can render vain or bring to naught, cause to be ineffective, the purpose of God 
in our own lives how or in our society how can we make what are some ways that we can make God's law be of not, not achieve um, I'm stumbling over my words here but what I want to say is how can we make God's plan ineffective personally how can we do that what are some ways that we can do that in our world today so Text me those if you have them, and in the meantime, I'm going to go ahead and tell you some of the things that some folks commented to me or that I thought about. One example that I can think of is in 1 Corinthians 5, when God said, if there's an unclean person in the church, you withdraw yourselves. He said, "You, there's a plan here. And this, In this particular instance, this man was committing fornication with his father's wife, and so God said there through the Holy Spirit, through the Apostle Paul, that if that is going on in your congregation, you withdraw yourselves from him and you deliver that man to Satan so that that leaven will not make the entire church impure. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. And there's quite a discussion there in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. By and large, Christendom, is not practicing that today. By and large, that's not happening today. When we don't practice it, it's rendered vain. If I don't do it, it's certainly not going to have the two effects. And we read those two effects in the in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. One effect is that perhaps it will cause repentance, and it did cause repentance in that man. We read that later on in 2 Corinthians. And secondly, it will purify the church. It will make the church know that we are serious about sin, as we've already talked about tonight. But it can't do those purposes if we don't do it. We render that commandment, that law, vain. We, in that sense, destroy that law. We render it ineffective. Another thing that I thought about, and actually a person wrote this to me and said, am I thinking right about this? What about the whole concept of many churches? She said, um, and she, she, this person who wrote this to me is, is not a member of the Church of Christ, but she said to me, I, what about the, the whole concept of many churches? Is, didn't God just want us to have the church? She's right about that. Matthew 15, verses 16 and following teach us about Christ saying, on this rock, I will build my church. He's talking about the church there. And when we, as, as people who wear the name of Christ, claim Christianity, when we decide that one system of faith is just as good as another system of faith, regardless of whether or not those systems are in conflict with what the New Testament teaches, and that I can go to heaven by doing what I think I want to do to be saved or what I think I need to do to be saved. Well, you can go to heaven doing something totally different and being a member of a church that doesn't wear the name of Christ, that wears the name of a man or of a system of a man or whatever it might be. And we can have all of these different ways and yet all of us can go to heaven, what we do is we negate the effectiveness of Christ's statement in Matthew 16, on this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. His plan for his one church is hampered when we decide, oh, we can just be a member of lots of varieties of churches and we still can go to the same place and we we can do different things to be saved you you can be baptized as a baby and never believe before baptism even though jesus said believe and be baptized you know i i'm gonna do it this way but we're all gonna end up in the same place no that is not the concept and we negate christ's concept for his church when we decide that we don't have to submit to his law. Remember, he has a law, the law of Christ. I thought about the example, and we have some examples here that are 
are being given to us. Do as I say, not as I do living. Oh, wow. If we, if we have that attitude, I'm going to, you know, I don't live the way that I preach. I'm going to tell you what the Bible says, but do as I say and not as I do. If we live that way, we negate the whole plan. We say it's not good enough for us. So we make it in vain. And um, Erica Greaves says, by altering his design. Oh, that's so good. Like women's roles in the church, proper worship, adding to, taking away. When we decide we can design it, then aren't we negating what he designed? Aren't we deciding that his design doesn't matter? So we make it of none effect. In our religious practices, in that sense, we, King James would be, we destroy it. What about, uh, let's see if we have some more right here. Um, telling a little white lie and thinking it's okay. Well, you know, Revelation 21, 8, all liars will have their part in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone. If we decide that, oh, there's a distinction between this kind of lie and this kind of lie, we negate that verse. We make it not have its desired effect for us. So um, there are lots of ways we can do that. I thought about marital fidelity. Ignoring his plan is wreaking havoc on our society today. I thought about the sanctification of Christians. Come, be ye separate. Come out from among them. If we can't be distinguished as Christians from the world around us, we negate the power of that positive influence on the world around us. We negate its power. We destroy what would have come about if we had done God's plan. Um, there are so, so many more examples of that. The plan for getting into Christ in the first place. Oh, we just mentioned that. Lots of different plans for being saved. But if we decide that his plan, which he so eloquently and yet simply said, he who believes and is baptized shall be saved. There's a lot more that comes with it, of course, after our baptism. It's living faithfully. But if we decide that, you know, we can be a part of Christ without ever having submitted to his, you know, someone said today, I heard someone say, if you believe that people aren't going to be saved without being baptized for the remission of their sins, you are arrogant. You think you have the way and the rest of the world has lost the way. I don't think that's I don't think that's arrogant. Because it doesn't matter what I believe. It doesn't matter what Cindy Colley believes at all. What matters is what the Lord said. And I believe that humility, and not that I am uh, I'm not the the example of humility here but humility is saying it's not what I think it's what he said and he said he who believes and is baptized shall be saved and if I figure out another way then I am making that salvation promise of none effect I'm I'm saying he said that in vain and to me that would be along the lines of being arrogant against Christ himself. So we have um, Holly polling, not studying our Bibles as we should, looking to the world for answers, looking to Facebook for answers, looking to the media rather than looking to our Bibles for the answers. She's so right about that. This is truth. And how we lose its wonderful effect on our lives the blessing that we get when we study it, when we ingest it, when we live it, we lose all that. If we don't do it, I know that what I'm saying is an oversimplification, but if we don't do what he said, we lose the wonderful effect that it's supposed to have in our lives, including salvation itself. So those are some of the comments that we have. Here's another one. Allowing friends and relatives to believe that they will go to heaven when they are following false doctrine. It's really hard for me. It's really hard for me because I have dear friends who aren't in Christ. They have never done what it takes to be in Christ. And sometimes I rationalize and I think with myself, I want to I wanna wait until the right moment. I want to wait until the seed will germinate. So when is the right time to say, 
you know, you're outside of Christ. Can I help you get into Christ? Not according to what I think, but according to what Jesus said. Can I help you get into the church that Jesus talked about when he, when he spoke in Matthew 16 that we just talked about? And sometimes I realize that we do need to wait until we will be heard. But if we wait people's lives away and allow them to die lost, then we make his plan for them of none effect. We help, we promote the destruction of his plan in their lives. Very good. So those are some examples. So let's look at Matthew 5, 17 again. He said, I am come not to destroy the purpose. Let's just reword it and put this meaning of the word destroy in there. I am come not to destroy the purpose of the law, but to complete that purpose. <laughs> Jesus was saying, I am the whole purpose of the law. And I have come not to make that law vain, not to set aside the purpose of that law, but I am the purpose of that law. Here's an example. What if, what if my daughter told my grandchildren, what if I was going to see them one afternoon as a surprise? And she put them down for their naps and she said, after nap time, there'll be a surprise. And then what if I came knocking at the door as soon as their naps were over and they said, well, Mammy, you can't come yet because we're going to get a surprise. You know what I would say? I am the surprise. Now, I don't want to trivialize what Jesus is saying here, but he was the fulfillment. He was the end of the law. And they didn't recognize that. And so they were, um, in effect, making the fulfillment of the law in vain. Destroy. He didn't come to destroy it. He didn't come to make it in vain, but he came to be the fulfillment of it. So what, what are parts of the law? Go ahead and give me your answers here too, if you can. What parts of the law can you think of that we all agree have been abolished? Can you, Julie, can you think of any part of the Old Testament law that we don't do today and that we aren't supposed to do? Sacrifice animals. Well, that's a great one. That's a great example. We don't do animal sacrifices anymore. She just read the verse a while ago. The blood of bulls and goats can't take away sin. So, so what parts of the law can you think of that we don't practice anymore? Go ahead and put them up there, and I'll read your answers out. Here are some that I thought of. Um, the Leverett Law, which is that if, if your husband dies, who are you supposed to marry in the Old Testament? According to the book of Ruth, you're supposed to, in Deuteronomy chapter 25, verses 5 to 10, you're supposed to marry your husband's closest of kin. That's not the way it is today. If my husband dies, I don't have to look for the person in his family to marry. I probably won't ever marry again because I just love him too much. But, but I don't have to look for the person in his family to marry because that's part of the old law. That's not repeated. It's abolished. And we recognize that it's abolished. What else can you think of that's abolished? I can think of Leviticus 25, the year of Jubilee. You know, every 50 years, all the servants went back home. And uh, every seventh year, the ground was supposed to um, be fallow to um, build back the nutrients in it. And they were supposed to rest from harvesting. And every 50th year... Everything reversed back to uh, debts were for some debts were forgiven and servants were allowed to go back home. There were some laws about that. And those are, you know, archaic. They're not they're not in our New Testaments and they're not for us today. Can you think of others that were definitely abolished? I think the Sabbath was abolished. Yes, the Sabbath is not, the all of those restrictions about the Sabbath are not in our New Testaments. And so the Sabbath is one of those. The stonings for Leviticus 20 verse 9, the stonings of someone who was blatantly and permanently disrespectful of parents. That, that's not happening today because we don't have that in the New Testament. Um, the adultery test in Numbers chapter 5, 11 to 31, you know, if a woman was accused of adultery, there were no witnesses, there was a, a, something she could drink and something was going to happen to rot her stomach if she 
had indeed committed that sin. That's not in our new covenant law, so it's been abolished. We have some people here, laws regarding the need for circumcision, laws regarding women's menstrual cycles, Leviticus 12 and Leviticus 15, the earthly priesthood and the ceremonial laws. Those are things that are coming in from those who are commenting, and they are exactly right. There's a lot of Old Testament laws that we all agree have been done away. But the question is, is it all or none? Do we have to be under all of the law or none of the law? Okay, so we read Matthew 5, 18, and you said, till heaven and earth pass away, not one iota was your version, or one tittle shall pass from the law till all is fulfilled. I'm going to tell you, there's a dig a bit about this this month, but I'm going to tell you what an iota is. It's the smallest letter of the alphabet. Not one of the smallest letters is going to be done away until it's all fulfilled. And we're going to find out where it was fulfilled. You've, we've already been suggesting where it was fulfilled. Christ was the fulfillment, but not one of the smallest letters or one tittle. You know what a tittle is? It's the dot over an I or a J. Not one dot over an I is going to be abrogated until it's all fulfilled. I just, I mean, even if heaven and earth passed away, nothing is going to change the Old Testament law until it is fulfilled. And remember, this is before Calvary. And Jesus was saying it's going to be fulfilled, but nothing's going to pass away no matter what happens. Nothing's going to pass away from the Old Testament law until it is all fulfilled. It's all or nothing. We're going to have the dot over the I until it's fulfilled, until it's finished. We're going to have it all until the time of the final goal arrived. I got this uh, um, from something I was reading from Wayne Jackson, and here's how he said it. Until the time of the final goal arrived, it would be easier for heaven and earth to pass than any part of the Old Testament law to be abrogated prior to its fulfillment. He said it succinctly, but that's what Jesus said here. So it's all or none. That's what Matthew 5, 18 says. Not the smallest part is going to pass. It's, it, it, heaven and earth can pass away, but not the smallest part is going to be done away until... It's fulfilled. So let's turn over to Galatians 3 again. We're back where we started and, and figure out what the fulfillment was. What was the fulfillment? Galatians 3, and if you'll start in verse 19, I probably will interrupt you. Galatians 3, verse 19, which we already read. <clears throat> Why then the law? It was added because of transgressions until the, off the offspring should come to whom the promise had been made. Okay. Until when? The promise had been made. Until the offspring should come of whom the promise was made. You're right. Until the offspring should come. The offspring, King James Version, the seed. And then she's, she read a while ago who the seed was. We're going to get to that. But this, the seed is Christ. So not one thing of it is going to change until that one seed, verse 16, which is Christ. So the fulfillment was the seed, Christ. The fulfillment, now you read 19. So I'm going to go ahead and, and read. Um, it was added because of transgressions till the seed should come or offspring to whom the promise was made and it was ordained by angels in the hand of an intermediary or a mediator. Wait a minute, a mediator. Jesus Christ is a mediator. In verse 20, I love verse 20. Now, a mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one. What he's saying is a mediator goes between two people. He was God, but he had to come down here to be a man so he could be in the middle and be as much man as he was God. He was the mediator, the perfect mediator. So then we read about something else that he was. Verse 21 says, Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, if the Old Testament could have given you life, then you could have been righteous by that law. But the scripture hath concluded all things are under sin, that the promise by faith 
of Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Before faith came, we were in jail under the law. Shut up to the faith which should afterwards be revealed. Verse 24, read that one. So then the law was our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. Okay, so mine says schoolmaster, hers says guardian. Both of those are good. Uh, I think the American Standard Version says tutor there. But I looked up this word, and what what it told me was in Judaism, there were guardians of little boys, and there were moral guardians. And those little boys, until they reached manhood in rich, affluent Jew, Jewish homes, were not allowed to step outside the house without the guardian. And the guardian stayed with them and carried them to the tutor, to the school every day, to the Jewish school every day. So he's telling us that this law is like those guardians that were, that were taking God's people around unto, where were they taking the people? Unto Christ. So that law was our schoolmaster until Jesus Christ came. And then verse 25 and 26, but after that faith has come, we are no longer under that guardian or tutor or schoolmaster. Verse 26, read that one. For in Christ Jesus, you are, you are all sons of God through faith. Through faith. When faith comes, we get to not be under the law of Moses anymore because it's been fulfilled. We get to be under the law of Christ. And how do we get into Christ? Verse 27, for as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. I love that. And the way that we get to be spiritual Jews today, verse 29, is if we're Christ. If we're under the law of Christ, then we get to be the children of promise today. We get to be heirs according to the promise. I love that. Now, I want to um, I want to talk just for a minute about before we, we'll close with our list on pages 156 and 157. But before we do that, I want us to talk just for a minute in view of all the, all the things that we've dug into tonight. I want us to talk about some of the sounds that I'm hearing in social media and among people who are wearing the name of Christ today that sound so good but are so opposed to law. And I've heard some of these this very week. My faith journey has led me to leave the Church of Christ. My faith journey has led me to leave this church. What is a faith journey? You see, Romans 10, 17 still reads, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. I don't have any sort of handle on the word of God. I don't understand it any better than you do when you read it. But I do from our conclusions tonight, from scripture, understand that there's a law. We are still under a law, not the law of Moses, but a law of faith. And faith comes by hearing the word of God. So my faith journey, in order to be acceptable to God, in order to be a journey to the throne of God, has to be deeply embedded in the law of Christ. There's a law. That means there has to be a standard of truth. So my faith journey has to be a journey that is within this standard of truth, which is his word. When I read about those people who would say, my faith journey has led me away from the church, I, I read a lot of vitriolic language. Things like, I guess... If you believe I'm going to be in hell because of my spaghetti straps, then I'm just going to enjoy being there with you 
because of your arrogance. Those kinds of statements. I, I've never heard. I've never heard anyone talk about folks going to be in hell because of spaghetti straps. I've never even heard that. I've never even thought of that. I've never even heard that. And we could talk about the propriety, the modesty issue. We could talk about all of that. But that's not the kind of language we use when we're talking about applications of Scripture. Or if you think I'm going to be in hell because I have a piano in worship, then, you know, what extreme arrogance. If you think I'm going to be in hell because my scruples aren't the same as yours, I'm just going to tell you that this language about a faith journey that leads us away from the church and the idea that there is one church that Christ built, when we begin to talk about that in vitriolic terms of hatred, it is powerful but it's very deceitful. That's not what God's child, that's not the way God's children talk about the law. We talk about the law as being our standard and ourselves, all of us, as being fallible people who must constantly be in the word. And, and our faith journey has to be based deeply in the law of Christ for which my Savior shed his blood. I'm also hearing statements like, but there's so much wrong. There's so much wrong with the Church of Christ. And I realize that I'm not talking to people who are exclusively members of what we think about as the Church of Christ, but I'm talking about the church that Jesus built when he said, upon this rock, I'm going to build my church. And when the Holy Spirit came on the apostles in Acts chapter 2, and they said, if you want to be saved, here's what you do. You repent and be baptized, verse 38, for the remission of your sins. And then the Lord added those people daily to what? To the church. And so I'm talking about that church. And when people say there's so much wrong with that church, that's really very offensive to me because of my Savior's blood that was given to purchase that church. He gave his blood for that church. There's nothing wrong with that church. Now, there might be a lot wrong. And in fact, there is a lot wrong with the people in that church. If there wasn't a lot wrong with the people in that church, we wouldn't need the cross. There's a lot wrong with me. There's a lot wrong with, I mean, outside of his blood. There's a lot wrong with all of us. But he made this plan where we could have his blood cleanse us. And where if we walk in the light, and not all of us are walking in the light, I understand that. There's sin and hypocrisy. There was in the Corinthian church, 1 Corinthians 5. And there was a plan of what to do about it. There was a law of what to do about it. There's a law. And so it's not the church that's all messed up. It's the people. When there's a mess, when there is whatever it is, immodesty or racism or false worship or whatever it might be that invades the body of Christ because of false teaching, the mess is never the plan. It's never the church. It's the people. And I want to say this too, that when someone says, I've left the church of Christ to become fill in the blank, a Catholic, an agnostic, a person of another, of, of a denomination. When a person says, I've left, in our climate that rejects largely law and truth, there will be very loud, very powerful, and very numerous voices of support, which makes me very sad. There will be lots of support when you say, I've finally become brave enough to leave this church. And my faith journey has taken me away from law. When you say that, there will be a lot of support, a lot of voices of approval, 
and there will be a lot of criticism, vitriolic criticism of those people who would say, but it's wrong for us to leave the law. It's, law, it's wrong for you to leave the church for which Jesus died. There will be a lot of criticism to those voices. But the fact is, still, as we pointed out tonight, there's law. It's not the law of Moses. It's the law of Christ. How could the Apostle Paul say in 2 Thessalonians 3, I charge you in the name of Jesus Christ that you do something? He said that. Wow, by the authority of Jesus Christ, I charge you. That's because there's a law. It's because it's a law. And I think about contend, Jude, the book, the whole book of Jude, really, but Jude verse 4, contend earnestly for the faith. That word the faith there is the doctrine. Contend. That's fight for it. Argue for it. Contend for the doctrine. There's something that's true. There's a standard here. There's a law for which we must fight, for which we must contend. If we turn to the book of Jude and we read verse 4, go ahead and read Jude verse 4 from your version, and then we'll look at my, at the King James as well. Jude verse 4. Wow, that's a tiny little book that's sometimes hard to find. Right before Revelation. Jude verse 4. For certain people have crept in unnoticed who long ago were designated for this condemnation, ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sen sensuality and deny our only master and our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, and the verse right before that was, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write to you of our common salvation, it was necessary for me to write and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith. What does yours say right there? That you should, it verse says, 3. It says contend for the faith. Okay. Mm -hmm. That you should contend for the faith. Appealing to you that you should contend for the faith, which was once delivered to the saints. There's doctrine that was delivered, and we're supposed to contend for it. Because, verse 4, there's false teachers who have come in, and they were ordained to condemnation. They were ungodly. And listen to this phrase. They turned the grace of God into lasciviousness. And she says sensuality. They, they turned the grace of God into sensuality. Wow. It's just amazing that we can say whatever fulfills our pleasures, whatever I think my relationship with God should be, whatever fulfills me in his service, whatever makes me most confident in my service to him, that's what I'll pick over the faith. And, and Jude, in a context where he talks about eternal damnation here, says we have to contend earnestly for the doctrine. If we go down the path that says, my faith journey has brought me here, and I know that it's much different from yours, and I still support you in your faith journey, even though your standards are much different as far as doctrine is concerned than mine. We're just on different teams, but we're doing the same thing. When we start believing that, then we are not contending for the doctrine and if we start believing that, it does away with sin altogether because it does away with our law. And remember what the law did? It make it, made us recognize sin. It made us know what sin was. We have to have law to even have sin. There's doctrine that is very important, very material to eternal life. Titus 1, this will be the last passage, Titus chapter 1. Titus is another kind of small bird, kind of small book. But if we look at Titus chapter 1, and go ahead and read verse 9. He must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught, 
so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. Oh, that is a power-packed verse. It's talking about elders here. And it says elders in the Lord's church have to hold fast or hold on to the faithful word as they have been taught by who? Well, it was the apostles in those days. It was Paul. That he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convict the false teachers. That's a power-packed verse. All that verse is saying is there's a law. And we've got to use that word, that doctrine, in order to convict false teachers. There's not a false teacher if there's not a law, if there's not a doctrine to which we must adhere. And in this context, it's elders who are leading the church that we are supposed to obey. And, you know, one of those comments that I was reading today said, uh, well, yes, I've left the church for Catholicism, and yes, I believe the Pope is the leader of God's people today. It's so hard to reconcile with the faithful word that's being given here, along with qualifications of the leaders. This person said, well, I believe God's always led his people through men with these qualifications in congregations. This is the doctrine that he calls is sound doctrine that we have to hold on to. And if you go on reading it, it says these um, false teachers, verse 11, their mouths must be stopped. And we can't give heed to, to the commandments of men, verse 14, who are turning from, wait a minute, leaving, turning from the truth. They profess that they know God, but they're denying him in their works. They're being disobedient. In verse chapter 2, verse 1, but instead speak the things that become sound. Oh, we don't like that word doctrine. We don't like that word law. We don't like the word authority. We don't like the word rules. But this says, speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. There's doctrine. There's a law. We've made that really abundantly clear as we've talked tonight. And it's here. And outside of this law, this law is material to your eternal salvation. Don't believe it because Sidney Colley said it. Not one jot or one tittle of the old law, not one iota, we would say, which is the, the Greek word there, will pass until it's fulfilled in the seed. Christ, but he came, and he fulfilled it, and he made a law, and if I'm going to not be arrogant, if I am going to be submissive, if I am going to have a meek spirit, if I am going to support people who are journeying in the faith, then I'm going to have to just obey his law. And that makes me his subject. And I, I, I vow to Christ, I vow that to you, that when we dig deep, we will be digging in this word because it is the power of God to salvation. To everybody who believes today, it, was, it used to just be for the Jews, the old law. But this is the power of God, Romans 1, 16, to salvation to all those who believe, Jew and Greek. All right, it's been a great study. Let's see if we have, we don't have more comments. So we're going to close with prayer. Don't forget the live stream is coming on August 23rd, which will be our reveal at 2 o'clock in that afternoon. So be sure that you're on board for that. Thank you for digging. You encourage me so much. And please, please pray for digging deep. Pray for our study together and pray that all of us will humbly submit before his word. Let's pray. Father, we are so very thankful for the time that we've had. We're so thankful for your word. We're so thankful for the law of Christ. And help us never to be arrogant in the face of that law. Help us never to be proud 
Help us to be humbly submissive. Help us to forbear with one another. Help us to put the needs of others before the needs of ourselves. And we know that that means being evangelistic. Help us to be evangelistic and bring others to your word. Help us, Father, to realize that when we see people, we should see souls. And help us, Father, to be ever thankful that we don't have that old priesthood that was marred by sin, that had to constantly sacrifice, that didn't go permanently beyond the veil, that we are so thankful that we have the perfect high priest and revelator, Jesus Christ. We are so thankful for the hope that we have because of that. So thankful for Jen and for Julie tonight who made helped make this possible who are um, and for all of the elders at the West Huntsville Church and for the people who constantly work to make Digging Deep happen. We pray your richest blessings on our spark that's coming up at the end of August and we pray for every woman and family who will travel to be a part of that. Help us as we make the preparations for it and help us Father to do all good through that program and no harm. Help us Father that we will be humble and submissive in your sight. We sin and we beg for forgiveness for our sins, but we're so thankful that when you look at us, you see Christ because we have put him on in baptism and because we are trying to walk in the light. And We pray, Father, that you will help us to never negate your plan in our lives, but always to make it fulfilling to find its fulfillment in the way that we live our lives and in the way that we die. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.